Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Scripture tells us that the end times will be a time of social and global chaos. And today, as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at Paul's specific instructions of what the world will look like in the days leading up to the return of Christ. We're also going to briefly talk about how we know the Bible is God's Word. And so welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. My name is Russ Brewer. I am pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is the Key Chapters Podcast. We're going through the Bible one chapter per day, trying to understand God's Word to us. And so today we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and the chaos that will be endemic throughout the world at the end of days. Now for time's sake, let's jump right into this passage starting in verse 1. Verse 1 takes us from the present day to the end days. And Paul says, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now we know from our study in the book of Daniel that the end times will be very difficult for the people of God. For instance, in Daniel 7.21, it says that during the tribulation, the Antichrist will wage war with the saints and even overpower them. Likewise, in Daniel 8, verses 9 to 14, the Antichrist wages war against the Jews. And so it stands to reason that the latter days will be difficult for all of God's people. And in this chapter here, Paul describes what this world will look like in these end days. But as we go through this passage, notice how this description is increasingly becoming true of our world today. And the more we look at the world around us, it seems like these prophecies are beginning to take shape. And so Paul describes this world in verses 2 to 5 saying, In these latter times, men will be lovers of self. Now our society is overrun with this cult of self. The self-improvement market is over a $10 billion a year industry, and it's only poised to grow more. And people are just wanting to just find out more and more ways to make themselves better, happier, things like that. And even if these people do go to church, often they're not actually gathering to worship God, but because they're trying to get something out of it for themselves. And, and so they're really going to church to worship the God of self. And we're seeing here this problem will only grow worse and worse leading up to the return of Christ. Likewise, these people will be lovers of money. The world has never had a per capita income or per capita wealth as it has right now, and yet avarice is epidemic and it's only growing worse. They will also be, as we see here, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parent. And these character traits are no surprise in a world that is dedicated to the God of self. Notice also in verse 2, these people are ungrateful. Now in America, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving, and it used to be a religious holiday where the entire country would set aside an entire day to thank God Nowadays, few churches have Thanksgiving services, and even on a day that's dedicated to thanking God, few people spend any time thanking God privately, let alone gathering together publicly. We're going on in verse 2. Paul also describes this future world as being unholy, and we're also seeing that in our world today because there's virtually nothing in our world that's dedicated to the Lord. It's only going to get worse. Then in verse 3, this world will be unloving and irreconcilable. And if you think about it, people who will love themselves so much, they can't love others. And when they have a conflict, they'll have no idea how to reconcile with others. Verse 3 also says there'll be malicious gossips, which again is no surprise because already much of our news is just focused on talking about people and what they've done and where they went and what they wore. Uh, That culture of gossip is just going to grow worse around this world. Going on in verse 3, these people will be without self-control, brutal, haters of good. In verse 4, they'll be treacherous, reckless, conceited. They'll also be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And again, this is already true of our world. Our world is addicted to entertainment and people will spend hours and hours, sometimes every day, just being entertained. We love entertainment in our society and we just love this pleasure and we would rather have pleasure for ourselves rather than seeking to please God. And finally, in verse 5, they hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Now, that phrase has a few interpretations, but I take this to mean that they will have an outward appearance of godliness and moral goodness, which is probably just the result of all kinds of social or maybe even governmental regulations that manufactures a form of goodness, but it's actually a counterfeit version of what is normally produced within a person who is actually in fellowship with God. And so, this is what society as, as a general whole will look like in the later times. But Paul also recognizes that people in our day will demonstrate these characteristics as well. And so he says in verse 5, avoid such men as these. We shouldn't have anything to do with people who demonstrate these kind of traits. And of course, we shouldn't be demonstrating them ourselves. Now, here's the thing. A society that is characterized by this kind of stuff that we're finding here in verses 2 to 5, 
it's also going to be filled with mental and spiritual anguish as people are weighed down by their sins. And a life that's filled with self-worship and endless entertainment, it's not the kind of life that God has designed us to have. And so those who pursue this kind of life, they will have a deep ache in their soul. And in verse 6, many women will be aware of their anguish and they will look for solutions. And these hucksters from this world will come on in claiming to be able to solve their problems and they'll lead many of these women astray. And so verse 6 describes us as, For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. And verse 7 says these charlatans will be always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You think about it, we live in the information age. People can spend night after night doing online research to solve just about every problem you can think of. And yet this verse is absolutely true of these people. They're always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, this knowledge of the truth comes from being born again and in fellowship with God. And Paul uses the same phrase back in chapter 2, verse 4, of being saved. And so the idea here is that this knowledge, which is the Greek word epinosis, and it speaks to understanding, or we can just pull these pieces together. If we do not know God, we will never truly have true knowledge of the truth. And since these people don't know God, they will never come to have this true knowledge of God or of his peace. Well, then in verses 8 to 10, it talks about two men named Yanes and Yambres. And these men are not mentioned in the Old Testament, but tradition says that they were Pharaoh's servants who opposed Moses as he sought to lead the people of God out of Egypt. And the point is that in the end times, God's work will be evident to everybody, and yet the world will still directly oppose God because they refuse to submit to him. And so then, in contradistinction to these false teachers, Paul says in verses 10 and 11, Now you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings. See, unlike the false teachers of the world, Paul is calling Timothy, he's calling us to follow his specific example. Follow his teaching. Take what he says and embrace this as the word of God. Follow his conduct. Live a life following his example and the way he lives. Follow his purpose. He was about Christ and the work of God. And may that be true of us as well. Follow his faith, patience, and love, because these are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Follow his perseverance in persecution and sufferings, because this is what is to be expected when we're living for Christ in the midst of a world that's otherwise rejecting him. In verse 11, Paul was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And so persecution is to be expected, which is why Paul says in verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Right now in America, we have the freedom to worship, air quotes around worship. That means we can believe anything we want and do whatever we want behind closed doors, but keep it there. But we don't exactly have the freedom to practice our religion, at least not like it used to be, because Christianity is inherently a religion that tells others about their need for Jesus. And the minute we start to do that, our world starts pushing back and we see it all around us. Now, this is to be expected. And the problem will just get worse and worse until the Lord returns. And so in verse 13, Paul says, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so in the end times, people will be impostors pretending to be what they're not. They will deceive others with their schemes and they'll be so drinking the Kool-Aid, they'll not actually realize that they themselves are deceived as well. Now, that's a pretty bleak picture of the future. Can we as God's people just not get caught up in this society? Well, Paul's instruction to him in verse 14 can also be Paul's instruction to whomever might be facing situations and times like that. And so in verse 14, Paul says, You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've received them. You see, when we continue in the teachings of Scripture, we will find the Word of God to be a light in the darkness that is a lamp for us, for our feet to walk. And the more we walk by the path of Scripture and the light of Scripture, the more we will become convinced of and see their wisdom for life and, and just trust that these are God's words for us. Now, verse 15 is continuing the thought of verse 14, but it adds another level of instruction. And verse 15 says, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the scripture that Paul is talking about here is the Old Testament scriptures. And even though the gospel is not crystal clear in the Old Testament like it is in the New Testament, God's new covenant people could read the Old Testament with these New Testament eyes and see the path that leads to salvation in Jesus Christ and his atoning death on our behalf. And we just see this in passages like Isaiah 53, which so clearly speak of and predict and prophesy the days of Christ and how he'll die as a sacrificial death on behalf of his people. 
And speaking of scriptures, in verse 16, Paul then tells Timothy, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now let's just talk about this topic of inspiration here. The word inspire here is the Greek word theonoustos, which means God breathe, as in these words, these scriptures have come from God to us. So let's talk more about what this means. What is inspiration? When we say that the Bible is inspired, we're talking about how the original documents were written by the authors of scripture and they were inspired by God. God used their personality, their background, their skill, their memories, uh, their understanding to communicate his message to us in words that he will declare as his own. Now, at times, God used verbal dictation, like with Isaiah in Isaiah 38, or dreams and vision, like with Joseph, or hearing and transcribing, like how the disciples recorded Christ's words, or just their memories, like with the Gospel of John, or with research, like the, the book of Luke. God used all of these different methods and means to communicate his word to us. Now, how do we know that God has inspired these words to us? Well, I'll just hit some quick summary points here. For one thing, the Bible says it's God speaking to us. Over 3,000 times it says this. Now, I realize this might seem like circular reasoning, but it's not. Because if God's word never said it was God's word, then we would have reason to not even be thinking of it in these categories. But it does declare to us that it is God's message, and it says this over 3,000 times. Now, to confirm this, the Bible is then filled with prophecies that we have seen fulfilled. Uh, if you want to see a list of these prophecies, Google the phrase fulfilled Bible prophecies or something like that. You're going to see all kinds of specific, clear ways the Bible has been fulfilled. You're going to see these aren't fortune cookie fulfillments that could have been anything. They are amazingly specific. Just for a couple examples, you can listen to podcasts on Isaiah 48 and Isaiah 50, which prophesies of the days of Cyrus, or how Daniel 9, the podcast in Daniel 9, just shows that when the Messiah will be entering in Jerusalem. These are incredibly specific prophecies given centuries before they occur, showing us that they've been actually inspired by God. Now, just quickly, other some indications of God's inspiration is the historical and scientific accuracy that, that even when these authors were writing things beyond their understanding, the Lord enabled them by inspiration to write what was true. So those are just some quick thoughts. Whole classes are taught on the doctrine of inspiration. We should leave it there. But if you have more questions on this topic, I'd encourage you to look into authors like Frank Turek, T-U-R-E-K, or Lee Strobel. They've got tons of great stuff written on this topic, and I'm sure it will be a blessing to you. Now, going back to the topic of scriptures, notice the purpose that God has given us the word of God. Verse 16 says that these scriptures are inspired and profitable for teaching, as in teaching what God wants us to know, for reproof and correction, as in correcting wrong beliefs and wrong actions, and then training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You see, the scriptures have everything a man or woman of God needs to be fully able to carry out every good work God has called them to do. Sometimes you want God's word to be like a book of magic spells or like one of those uh, toy eight ball toys where you just kind of shake it and tells you what to do or, or gives us some kind of insights into some mystery we saw on TV. That's not the purpose of the word of God. The purpose of the word of God is to show us how to live life in fellowship with God and how to serve him. If our goal is to serve him and do good works in his name, then we have everything we need in the scriptures. This also points to the fact that we don't need new revelation. Here in verse 17, we're seeing that the scriptures have given us everything we need for every good work. And people who are claiming to speak for God today are inherently denying the reality of this verse because they're saying that God has a new message for us today, something else that we needed because we didn't have enough of what we have in the word of God. That's not the case. We don't need anything new. We have all we need right here in the copies of the Bible that we're holding in our hands. All right, well, so that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, and that was just a quick run through of this chapter here as it describes the end time chaos, as well as just a few comments on the doctrine of inspiration. Now, by way of quick review, the opening verses of this passage describe a world that no one's going to want to live in. The world won't want to live in this world either, but they won't understand why they're so miserable. They'll be miserable because they've rejected God and his word. But we, as God's people, let us hold fast to the truths we find in the word of God that we might not be led astray today or even later in the end of days if we were to be there during that time. Finally, this passage also points us to the divine authorship of Scripture. Paul calls Timothy to be convinced of these things, and, and are you convinced of the truthfulness of Scripture? And let me just say that if you're not, I actually can understand. When I first started reading the Word of God, in the back of my mind, I was always doubting and questioning and worrying that I'd eventually find something that would finally undermine the Bible. But after 30 years of reading the Bible, that's not been the case. 
I'm not brainwashed. I didn't even grow up believing these things. I'm not easily deceived, but I have found God's word to be just that, the words of God. They are words that God has confirmed with us through prophecy that helps us to know that this is God's message for us. And if you're uneasy in your faith, well, first pray about that. Bring that to the Lord. He's not going to be surprised for one thing. And ultimately, any faith we have, any trust we have in God's word must come from him in the first place. So bring that to the Lord. And second, submit to what you're reading. God's word is meant to be believed and obeyed. And if you have no intention to actually live it, you're going to find that its message and its meaning they just elude you. And so pray about these things and seek to obey it. And I trust that you too will find, in fact, that the Bible is truly God's word to us. Well, we're going to end things there. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless.